Hello and welcome to Armchair Astronauts. This is a conversation with the communications director of Maine-based Blue Shift Aerospace, Seth Lockman. You'll notice that this video has several cuts in it, and this is because it was less of a formal interview and more of a friendly chat about both Blue Shift and the aerospace industry as a whole. We sincerely enjoyed this opportunity, and we hope you enjoy watching this video. Uh, I'm, I'm Seth Lockman. I'm the, the comms director at Blue Shift, and uh, it, it's really exciting to be here on the Armchair Astronauts. We, we met through the Blue Shift uh, Discord server, and hopefully this is just the start of, of many similar collaborations for both of us. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in Blue Shift? What a story. Okay. So I, uh, uh, in college, uh, first I should backtrack a little bit. So I, I went to a magnet school for math and science. Mm -hmm. um, maybe got a little burned out from the rigor. And so in college, I went soft sciences, uh, which is not a career move that I would advise for anyone aspiring to work at a rocket company. Obviously, it worked out at least once, um, but I wound up majoring in psychology. Um, and I also studied computer programming and rapid prototyping, which helped me tremendously. And I even think psychology helped me tremendously because it's um, it, none, none of that Freud stuff. It's really about going into a complex system where there are more variables than you will ever understand. And you need to sort through the noise and pare it down to one manipulable condition, one measurable one. You, you can add you know, up to five or six variables in some cases before it just becomes just noise. But it's about focusing on what you know and what you can control, which is often <laughs> either a subset of what you know or something totally different entirely. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's about, you know, working, working the gas and the clutch pedals of your mind respectively um, with a lot of computer programming. So anyway, that was kind of my focus. And I graduated uh, with no intent to, to pursue a master's either for research or clinical and psychology. Um, so I did the next best thing, which is work in restaurants. And eventually, I moved up in the world. I got a retail job. That was very exciting. So through all of this, um, to, to hold on to my identity, essentially, I went back to the local planetarium where I had interned when I was at that high school. And I actually, uh, I was the guy who, like, Ministry of Truth style, had to rewrite the engineer's script for the show Nine Planets and Counting. I erased Pluto from the show. And uh, yeah, so that was that was my hatchet job. <laughs> anyway, I went back and I said, Ed, I would like to, you know, volunteer at the planetarium. He said, sure. So I got started. I was working with, uh, you know, interns there uh, and we, we were coming up with all these different projects. And I thought, you know, there's a radio station like right across the street. What if we went over there and we like got the science department talking with the journalism department? And we started a collaboration. We started doing a show on space science. So I went over, I pitched the show. And, you know, 45 minutes later, Ed and I are like co-hosts of this new show, which the working title, you'll like this, was The Armchair Astronomer. Oh, wow. Um, but we ultimately settled on radio astronomy. And that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, that show ran for four years. It's still going under a different name. All the other uh, co-panelists are, are still there. The fun thing about community radio is the management really likes if you have kind of like a, a local flavor, right? And if you have a talk show about beer or in, in Portland, Maine, if you're talking about music, we have a very vibrant kind of amateur music scene. Easy, right? Space science, I didn't really know what I was signing up for. I assumed this was going to be very difficult to find uh, rocket scientists in Maine. And actually it, it wasn't. Uh, we've got two rocket companies. We've got a couple people working from home for NASA, including the principal investigator on several instruments uh, across various Mars rovers currently. Uh, we've got a guy that invented a new type of space glove and ultimately played a very integral role in designing the pressure garment for the dragon suit. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a company that moved here um, specifically to hire uh, mill workers, textile workers, that the mill had just shut down. And what were they gonna do? Were they gonna retrain? Well, it turns out with minimal retraining, um, they started working on heat shields for Mars rovers. So 
there's this whole vibrant, quietly thriving aerospace industry in Maine that people just don't know about because they're, you know, looking for the blueberry soap shaped like a lobster in the gift shop. You know, that's like, that's, we have a reputation, right? And, um, and then there's all this aerospace stuff that just kind of uh, isn't, isn't so well known about. And that's not to be disparaging. Our heritage industries are actually critical. We want to work with them, um, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, but all of that, you know, sustainable agriculture, forestry, um, uh, it's, it all ties into what you can achieve with uh, CubeSat constellations and small launch vehicles, uh, like what we, what Blue Shift is developing. So anyway, I started interviewing all these, um, all these people from all across the state. I wound up getting a hold of this guy up in Brunswick. He was working on hybrid rocket engines. And I thought, well, I mean, there's no, there's no reason why that couldn't work. Like, I think, I think Virgin Galactic is doing that too, right? And I looked it up and they yeah. went, I was like, okay, okay, hybrid rockets commercially. Let's, I'll talk to the guy. Um, so we had a little bit of a back and forth. And after a couple of months, he came in. We had so much fun. We did two interviews. Um, so we did two shows. <laughs> I guess he was interviewing me at the same time. And before you know it, I'm helping out on social media. And I went up to do a, a job interview. The job interview was digging a flame trench. Um, it was him and me just kind of shoveling and nerding out about space. And that was uh, not what I was expecting at all, but it was awesome. And um, so one thing led to another and now I'm doing science communication and public relations for, uh, for one of Maine's two rocket companies. I did not know there was such a detailed and uh... Yeah, basically such a detailed story about how you got involved in Blue Shift. It was very interesting. Um, so um, more about uh, biofuels. Yeah. Um, you're one of the only um, rocket companies that are actually using uh, biofuels actively to um, launch. And in addition to that, you're using um, uh, hybrid motors. Um, but there's also the fact that not many launch companies are using specifically biofuels um, to launch their rockets. So um, do you think this um, use of biofuels is scalable to the entire industry? That is a good question. And it's hard to answer. Um, there are a number of companies working on the kind of the biofuel question uh, more generally. Um, but they're not all doing hybrid rockets. Uh, I think the I think the first biofuel in a rocket, at least as far back as I could find, you know, a good record of, was the V2 in World War II. It burned ethyl alcohol, so ethanol and water. Um, so I guess they had to dilute the ethanol a little bit to get a stable reaction. Um, there are a number of folks that are, uh, including one company in Argentina that launched within a couple days of our prototype as well. So they had a liquid propellant rocket. They're uh, essentially burning biodiesel, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but that was a liquid propellant rocket. So we're doing hybrid. So there's not a ton of overlap. Um, I certainly hope that bio derived fuels, not, not just, not just biofuels and biodrive fuels, stuff that is at, at the very least carbon neutral. So, you know, combustion is a great way to get exhaust velocity. Uh, there's no debating that, but hopefully uh, the, the CO2 that kind of inevitably follows from that um, can at least be recaptured by producing the fuel again. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it could be as simple as uh, green and sustainable ways to electrolyze hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but there are a lot, there are a lot of different ways to tackle that problem. So, um, so, you know, I, I think that there is a critical role there. And then what, what our fuel also is on top of being carb, almost carbon neutral is it's non-toxic. So, even in cases where you have a nominal splashdown of a spent stage, right? And it just kind of lands a couple thousand miles off into the ocean. There's still residues that are coming out and potentially affecting the wildlife. Um, and we, we don't have, we don't have that issue either. So, uh, so I, I hope there's a future for carbon neutral stuff, non-toxic stuff and carbon neutral and non-toxic fuels. Um, but I don't think that our way is the only way. So if you look at the like over a hundred companies across the, the world that are trying to move on this space, 
as the industry kind of approaches that that hockey stick, right? Um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, our, our good friends Vault um, up at the other end of the state, they're working on an air breathing engine. So as far as I'm aware, they're, they're still burning the traditional fuel, but much, much less of it because through the lower atmosphere, they don't have to haul all that oxidizer with them. So that's a tremendous reduction in carbon footprint right there. Um, there's a, a, a company that's working on a steam powered first stage, just water under incredible pressure. Um, they get thrust that way. There's this idea of a raccoon where you essentially replace the first stage of the rocket with a balloon, um, a weather balloon or, or bigger as needed. And you just get up above most of the atmosphere, drop the little rocket and it, it you know, goes off into orbit. So there, there are many, many ways to have less of an impact on the environment while still allowing humanity to accelerate through this this fourth industrial revolution and you know get get really good connectivity and earth imaging and all the kind of stuff that we're going to need in order to move forward uh, with with a lot of the for example heritage industries in the state of Maine but you know all around the world mm -hmm. yeah um, so basically not just the utilization of biofuels just the process of making the fuels develop um, and there are all different kinds of biofuels you can use, carbon neutrality. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of what we're doing. And I think that what Blue Shift is gonna do is, is take a huge slice of that market because mm -hmm. of what we're doing with our fuel and other aspects of the service that we can provide. Um, but I don't, I don't think we're the only ones. And it's, it, I, I believe it's very exciting to see the work that's going on, um, you know, in, in, we're with the same goal, but different ways to get there across the mm -hmm. industry of, right. of being kinder to the earth. Yeah. Um, so uh, Blue Shift has three different launch vehicles. Yeah. Um, yes. Better yeah. uh, have either been launched or in, are in development. So you have um, Stardust, which is, I guess, the best way to explain it is your uh, technology demonstrator. Yes. sounding rocket um you have starless rogue which is your um like suborbital um op, like customer available sounding rocket um and then you have red dwarf which is your three-stage or uh, orbital vehicle capable of carrying 30 car uh, 30 kilograms to low earth orbit yes um so my uh, my question is: um, Do you have any future rocket concepts that you plan to pursue after Red Dwarf? Not necessarily like specifics, just um, ideas, concepts. Any? Yeah, yeah. So I should I should say um, specific to to Red Dwarf. Uh, as as of recording, we actually have a pretty exciting announcement coming up about a couple of of design changes, um, which is kind of the the fun thing about working at such a small company is that you can have these these fluid moments where you figure out, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do something fundamentally different here and then just redesign everything right on up from there. And it takes a couple of days to just pivot. Um, but, but yeah, so, so we wanna do sub, the suborbital service where you launch a payload straight up and straight down um, that the payload gets exposure to hard vacuum, depending on where it's launched, it may get above the earth's magnetic field if you can get you know far enough north or south and you get industry standards about like three four minutes in microgravity we think we can do double that uh, and then uh, so th there's a market there and then there's the market of orbit and we want to do something a little different where we're targeting uh polar orbits that go kind of, oh here's here's the earth uh so it kind of goes like over i think the north pole would be up here and then just you know straight south uh, and then, if, you know, as the Earth turns in, it would you know be going the other way, too. Uh, apparently, but um, yeah. So, so we want to focus on that. It's low Earth orbits, so you only get a couple of months on orbit, which is probably enough to run a scientific experiment or something like that. Uh, and there might be exceptions where we go a little bit higher than that. Um, but yeah. So, so if we want to go beyond low Earth orbit, there are uh, some some challenges that we'll need to address just with the the type of fuel we're using, uh, but it's it's on the drawing board. Mm -hmm. There's a reach goal of doing something like um, 
you know, maybe a sample return mission or something like that. Okay. Um, so um, earlier we talked about uh, other companies that are in the same market as you and mm -hmm. developing the same technologies as you. Um, some of these, especially um, ones that are able to launch um, to a polar orbit, such as Astra or even um, SpaceX um, out of Vandenberg, um, and even other launch vehicles such as Rocket Lab, Relativity, Aerospace, Virgin Orbit, as you mentioned earlier, um, ABL, they're all developing and launching um, small launch vehicles like you. So how do you plan to stay competitive in this market that's saturated, uh, saturated with all these um, rocket companies? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, and it comes down not so much to the, the rocket itself as to what we want to do with it. Um, so the, the first thing is that we want to be doing a dedicated small launch, or in the case of suborbital, kind of like nano launch, where uh, suborbital is you know, 30 kilograms. Uh, so your, your payload, assuming it's a 1U CubeSat, which is a, a, a U is a standard unit of uh, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So it's a little bigger than a Rubik's cube. Uh, 1.33 kilograms or less is this is the standard. So that's uh, that's kind of the smallest general satellite. But I think multiples of that, like usually a 3U is kind of the most common. But anyway, you would have at most 30 folks that you're ride sharing with. And that would be a big difference because often you're ride sharing with hundreds of other payloads, uh, which is just very chaotic. And often with a small satellite or sort of small experimental platform, you're, uh, you're flying as a secondary payload to some much larger payload. And so maybe a large telecoms corporation or a branch of, of the Department of Defense, you know, they come in and they say, oh, we got to we got to turn a bolt on the satellite. We're going to delay the whole mission by four months to do that. Um, and you kind of grin and bear it because that's what you got to do. But for a small business, that's a tremendous opportunity cost. And for a school, uh, that that could be, you know, oh, your capstone's getting finished at the start of the year after you graduate or, you know, whatever. So that can be a real problem. So we want to we want to um, remove that. We also are going to be offering uh, the, the rockets are not going to be crew rated. And so that's going to save people a lot of time at R and D um, that currently, if, you, if you're going to launch on, let's say um, the, the new shepherd, right. Or uh, maybe you're going up to the space station. So you launch on a dragon because those rockets could conceivably launch humans, regardless of whether or not there are actually people on that actual flight you will still need to go through additional rigors for structural stability, for off-gassing, for a number of other things. Then that's gonna cost additional time and money. So what we're offering is something that's dedicated to small payloads. So they're flying primary. It's not crew rated. So uh, there's not quite as much testing to, to be done. And we want to, by, by offering, offering that dedicated small service, um, kind of get around some of the delays that can happen where, you know, maybe someone misses a flight, but because of our high launch cadence, oh, they'll catch the next one, right? It's like, it's like missing an airline flight in a, in an airport today. And you just go to the mm -hmm. desk and you're like, okay, can I take the next one in a couple hours? It's, it's certainly not fun, but it's much better than you have to wait a year and a half mm -hmm. or we delayed the whole plane, you know, for four hours for you. And now everyone's inconvenienced. So mm -hmm. yeah, basically it's, it's the, more of the service aspects of the model that uh, that's where we expect to differentiate ourselves mm -hmm. so basically with um less development uh, time more launch cadence um you're expecting to beat out um not necessarily beat out just provide um more opportunities for your customers yeah yeah exactly um uh I don't, I don't think even the most optimistic among us here expect to, to totally conquer, you know, the market, but even, even if we carve out a small um, niche, we can still become very, uh, very effective, at, at least on the United States Eastern seaboard, but we have um, 
we have kind of a, a partnership with this company, Max IQ, and they are, they're pulling in payloads uh, that, that are going to fly on our first flight from all over the world. And so I think our reach really could be could be global. We could really have a positive effect um, for folks that uh, it would just it would just save them a little bit of a headache uh, going with this you know dedicated, not crew rated, rapid launching company. Um, so um, specifying about that um, niche that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, so is there like a specific kind of customer you um, are targeting to launch, like a specific a specific kind of company or such? Yeah, yeah. Um, so especially for suborbital, like the, 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 the beachhead customer, the folks we want to reach are researchers. That could be academic, um, like I was saying, you know, a, a college or an uh, undergrad uh, with a capstone project. Um, although, uh, you know, ev everything I've, I've seen middle schools participate in in orbital missions. Um, so, you know, it's it's really almost like K through 12 up through masters. Right. So, so the whole. Maybe maybe K is a little young, but I'm, I'm not going to set that boundary. You know, mm -hmm. let let this uh, that's not my place to say so. The, uh, the point is that those, you know, there's pure academic research, then there's um, like, uh, I guess it wouldn't, it wouldn't be like, like the Planetary Society or Berkeley Lab or um, Brookhaven or something like that, right? Those, those guys aren't, I don't know if I would call them pure academic, mm -hmm. but there's still research to be done. You know, we'd, we'd love to launch the next light sail mission. Um, because you know, bi dry fuel, photonic propulsion, match made in heaven, right? Um, but yeah, whatever whatever <laughs> ends up happening over there, it still is definitely exploratory. Um, so we'll call it research. And then there's um, business research. So maybe you have a uh, uh, something that you want to test. Maybe it's a manufacturing process. Maybe you have a new material that you want to see how it's going to perform under launch conditions. Uh, we had a client on our, our tech demo mission that actually, they didn't care uh, that we were only gonna have a few seconds of pseudo microgravity. They wanted launch conditions. They wanted G loading. They wanted that lateral kind of vibration loading. And they wanted to see if they could dampen it with a new technology that would be cheaper, more reliable um, than, and, and also less massive. So that would also make it more uh, cheaper, right? Uh, but. Uh, they wanted to see if they could beat out the current kind of bushing systems for for cradling uh, small satellites because about 50% of them arrive on orbit with some sort of damage. And so they were testing that that new technology. Uh, so small businesses, whether they're testing how something is going to perform or whether they can manufacture a material or you know maybe some sort of pharmaceutical or something in microgravity, those those are the folks that we want to to reach and be serving. Mm -hmm. So uh, one last question to kind of close things out. Um, so um, a lot of these uh, small launch companies, like I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, such as like Astra, Rocket Lab, um, they have um, innovative launch infrastructure solutions, such as, mm -hmm. for example, Astra can launch pretty much anywhere, um, basically out of a trailer. Um, yes. Yeah. So. Um, do you guys have any um, uh, perhaps launch infrastructure um, such as this that you're planning to develop or launch with? Yeah, so Stardust launched off of a trailer, mm -hmm. uh, which was an amazing experience because I'm I, I I drove up to uh, the launch site. I was I was in my vehicle. I was following behind uh, the CEO Sasha who had the the trailer in tow, and I was watching this thing. Um, and I was thinking, I'm used to launch pads that go at like three miles an hour, unladen. This thing's doing 80, you know? Uh, so that was that was kind of one of those moments of, oh, this is new space. We're doing things a little differently here. Um, but yeah, so so we have experience using a launch trailer. Uh, there's a plan for Starless Rogue, the suborbital one. Um, we, we may wind up using a launch trailer depending on where we launch from and what makes the most sense. Um, and then for Red Dwarf, uh, I think that is still 
on the drawing board exactly how we're, we're going to do that. Um, cause once you get up to those sizes, I mean, it, it still is a very small rocket, but, um, how exactly we're going to anchor that, that guide rail, um, it's a right, right now we're just mostly focused on Starless Road. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have an announcement about that down the road. Um, but yeah, certainly the, the goal is versatility. Mm, yeah. Uh, I can see a lot of companies are certainly tracking for that. Um, especially in terms of like launch cadence and stuff. So um, I was wondering more, I know you can't get like any specifics about like um, your Marvel engine, but it's it's just so fascinating, like um, using a hybrid biofuel. It's something I've re really never heard about in um, the industry. Um, so I, I know that like most, most rocket companies, I guess, don't, don't really have an interest in that. Um, and you mentioned in um, your video um, um, answering what like such what are the benefits of using um, biofuel um, um, on the on that meeting with uh, Sasha. Um, you mentioned uh, Sasha rather mentioned that um, most of these rocket companies um, they either use toxic fuels such as um, hydrazine or N two O four or they produce toxic exhausts, um, mix oxides of nitrogen. Um, so there, there is gonna be some kind of exhaust, right? Like, yes. um, so like you can't, you can't necessarily avoid that. Um, so. No, no, I mean, yeah. the, the, two, the two best ways to get gas particles going out the back of a nozzle as fast as possible are combustion and uh, pr probably uranium rods, right? And so, mm -hmm. as a civilization, we've agreed one of those is definitely out. We're not doing that, right? Um, and that's a good thing, I think. Um, but then, you know, com combustion is just where it's at in terms of getting stuff from cryogenic temperatures to a couple thousand of degrees uh, and getting really good exhaust velocity. Uh, that's that's just where where it's at. Um, so the, the two, the two thoughts, our thought is, well, what if you could recapture that carbon, mm -hmm. right? By manufacturing more of the fuel. So it's, it's a closed, you know, net neutral, right? Which is pretty good. Um, and then there are other solutions, uh, like, <laughs> did you see spin launch? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. That was awesome. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll take care of the first stage. Yeah, sure. Just mm -hmm. fling it. I mean, the, yeah. the, um, the, the flinging, that's that's the easy, well, right up until the moment of the fling. Mm -hmm. I would, things are pretty straightforward, right? But then there's the question of we're just, get, we're, we've spun something up very, very fast, and then we're just dropping a couple hundred pounds, right? Mm -hmm. How do you rebalance that without just, I mean, you can't put a brick in a washing machine without seriously messing it up. They're taking that concept, but faster and with much more mass. Mm -hmm. So how, how do they do that? I don't know. But uh, that's another terrific solution. Yeah. I mean, I've heard they're doing some like crazy stuff with vacuum chambers and yeah. to get all that like working. Um, but I, uh, and again, like a lot of people aren't really doing this, like um, biofuels will, uh, for one and uh, uh, hybrid engines for another. Um, I guess Virgin Galactic is really the only one that's um, using hybrids other than um other than you guys um so is there like any i guess um benefit in terms of like thrust or efficiency or um i guess delta v or that kind of stuff you can maybe yeah. elaborate on okay so super high level right if you've got a solid rocket engine mm -hmm. you have your oxidizer and your fuel kind of suspended together mm -hmm. usually some accelerants in there you're getting uh, unparalleled energy density, right? That delta V. However, at this, one of the shuttle astronauts said, like, once you light that candle, you're going somewhere fast, right? You can't, you, you can control it in terms of when you actually, you know, put the fuel in there, you can have different shapes, uh, you know, internal sections and, and like flutes and stuff. Uh, and you can control the, you know, the mixture and all that. But, but basically once you've, once you've set off the ignition, 
right? You're not, there's no throttling down. There's no turning it off. There's no, you're not stopping and starting it again. It's just, it's going. And that's whether it's a gunpowder SD's rocket or a space shuttle solid rocket booster, right? Uh, so you lose some, uh, some, some fine control there. Mm. But if you need to haul a plane made out of bricks 40 miles into midair, pretty good way to do it, right? Okay. On the other hand, you've got liquid propellant rockets. Um, so you have a liquid oxidizer, a liquid fuel, uh, usually at cryogenic temperatures, just to be able to pack a little bit more in there and get uh, even more of a temperature gradient, even greater exhaust velocity and all that. Um, and then, so you, you mix them. And it's just like balancing hot and cold water um, if you were trying to accelerate your sink to orbital velocities. But basically you get that balance right. Uh, you can speed it up, slow it down. You can turn it off and on again in certain cases. Um, and you have just a much finer control over what you're doing. Um, but then the downside there is complexity because you need turbo pumps. Each turbo pump like costs at least as much as a college education. I mean, it's very, very um, expensive. Um, and, and there's all kinds of extra moving parts, pneumatics, hydraulics, whatever. Um, and so you're adding cost and complexity and weight, which in turn adds cost and complexity into rocket equation just kind of snowballs a little bit. And yeah, so, so there's, you have like clear pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. So then some genius uh, or, or more likely a series of geniuses across cultures and times, this idea started to develop of like, okay, let's have a solid fuel. So we have that energy density. We're gonna have a liquid oxidizer and then you have a valve and you control the valve, you control the oxidizer flow you can then control the rate at which, at, at which they mix. And so you have good energy density from the fuel, a little bit less from the oxidizer, but you get controllability from the oxidizer. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of complexity, complexity added because you then need an igniter motor because usually uh, the, the oxidizer and the fuel won't really react if they just come into contact with each other, you need a heat source. Uh, so you have a little smaller igniter motor off to the side and then, you know, voila, you've got much, much less plumbing and very good performance. But then you start coming into issues of stability, particularly in a pressure fed system with the with oxidizer being pressure fed um, because the pressure in the oxidizer tank is changing. So that's changing the flow rate. So now you're not just, it's not just a simple matter of turning that, that valve because the, the conditions that the valve is manipulating are also changing. And then the, the fuel is kind of burning from the inside out. So fuel is probably being consumed at a more or less constant rate in most cases. But then that means that the rate of change of the shape of the engine is changing. And so that's a, you know, very difficult to get stable combustion there. And so for a very long time, hybrid rockets have really just kind of been this hobbyist thing, this esoteric hobbyist thing. And recently, a couple of companies, us, Virgin Galactic, I want to I want to say Gilmore Space in Australia, um, but I mean it's it's really just a handful. But there are some companies that are starting to go into this this brave new world of hybrid rockets, and um, and so if if they can solve that stability of combustion issue, then they've got a very competitive rocket. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it's really, uh, the only like solid rockets that have really like, um, gotten into orbit are just like converted ICBMs and they're, um, like the Minuteman, Minotaur, um, they're really just, um, I guess only for military launches and, um, I guess mm -hmm. solids, solids. Oh, as you said, they're um, they're inherently at least a little bit more dangerous um, because of the fact that you can't actively throttle, and um, once you start, you can't really stop. And then the problems you try to solve for that with liquid rockets, as you said, is just complexity. But then you have you kind of have this balance that you have with um that you guys are doing with uh, hybrid rockets um with 
solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer. Um, and I guess you can't um, uh, like elaborate on that. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Um, so, yeah. Um, is there anything else? So, yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, everything I have on this sheet is about your engines. I just love them so much. Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, depending on when this is released, we may have an engine test coming right up. Our, our We've been scaling up to the, the full-scale Marvel, um, which is we, we, uh, we got a NASA grant to work on the, that combustion stability issue. And we, we submitted two proposals. Uh, the, the movie Captain Marvel came out, so we came up with acronyms Captain and Marvel. Captain didn't make it, Marvel made it. Um, and it's, we, we flipped two of the letters around. So it's modular, adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch. So it's like Marvel or something. <laughs> yeah. Same Marvel. Um, and the one that flew on Stardust was a six inch diameter. And the one that's going to be uh, testing, so this is a static fire test. We will not be launching anything on purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's about two feet across. It's about 10 times more thrust. And that's the one that'll actually get up into space. Um, we're a couple of weeks away from a test and then we'll be doing a series of tests all throughout early uh, 2022. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're watching in early 2022, check us out. We may have some dates posted uh, for, a, for a live stream of a test. Yeah. Um, and I know you guys are um, based in like Maine and you, you probably plan, uh, plan to conduct most of your launches from there. Um, so, but I was wondering, um, there are several pads um, at like Cape Canaveral and mm -hmm. I don't know about Vandenberg, uh, they've pretty much all their pads booked, but, um, and yeah. there is there is a launch site um, in my state of um, Camden, Georgia, uh, Camden. Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, Vector just went um out of business. Um, they were gonna launch from there. Um, but um, were you guys having any plans to launch from like Florida or perhaps a slight possibility, maybe, uh, maybe even here? Yeah, yeah. We've we've looked at a lot of options. Um, particularly because in the main winter, the jet stream becomes incredibly powerful to the point where it could just pull a rocket off, off track. Um, and the, the costs of correcting for that as you head into and then out of the jet stream uh, could just be too fuel intensive, uh, not, not to mention all the structural reinforcement that would be necessary. So in those cases, in the winter, it might be easier to go somewhere that's a little bit more temperate, less of a jet stream, um, and, and the, it, it's, it's not an issue of cold. The engine actually performs very well in the cold. Um, but the other thing about going south is that it opens up equatorial orbit to us. So we, we really want to be focusing on polar orbits for our customers. We, have, we believe that's where the need is. However, there are a fair number of payloads that it doesn't really matter which orbit they're in. And particularly if we do hear back very robustly. No, we want equatorial or low inclination orbits. Um, then moving south solves that uh, issue as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I believe like an uh, an equatorial orbit would also like increase your payload capacity from from thirty to, um, kilograms, or is that just like a general? Yeah, I guess I guess in theory it would. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because the farther south you launch, you're picking up rotational velocity from the Earth, which is basically free gas, and, uh, unless unless you do it enough times, and then you slow the Earth's rotation down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have to worry about that yet. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess you could take the same fuel in the same rocket, launch closer to the equator into an equatorial orbit, and have some increase in payload capacity. Mm -hmm. What would that be? I have no idea, but I love the question. That is that is terrific. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have the volume to, to handle that. So in theory, yeah. we could do it. So I guess you could launch um, perhaps like larger, um, like 
cubes after well that open up like a whole new like i don't think that would open like a whole new market up or anything but like no, i don't know yeah. Be something like you know starless rogue winter 33 <laughs> kilograms to orbit, you know yeah or suborbitally yeah um no so so yeah it would only only red dwarf would be affected because suborbital wouldn't really no. matter um so yeah that's um man that is a good question <laughs> um and so far it's just the united states right you're not planning on are you are you planning on doing any activities like internationally perhaps no and uh part of that is the itar mm -hmm. uh, it's just yeah. much simpler to keep things d domestic um, but also there would be an incredible irony to coming up with a carbon neutral fuel and then you know shipping it by truck across the uh the u.s which if you know if we have to do that we'll still do that it's, it's still i think a net benefit to the world to be doing more launches that are carbon neutral um, but if we can keep our logistics lines short and also be creating jobs here in Maine where many uh, STEM grads have to leave the state to find employment in their fields. Mm. Uh, if we can, you know, if, if we can keep it local in that way, we could, we could address both of those points. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the goal. Um, I think that's it for me. Is there anything like that you wanted to ask me? I mean, there's probably not, but is there no, that's, uh, I mean, you, you taught me something the other day. You, you, you said, uh, cause we were going to do this interview last weekend. Right. You said, Oh, I'm working on a video about the Titan four. And mm -hmm. I said, Oh, that was the one from Gemini. Wasn't it? And yeah. you said, uh, Titan two. What's that? And I was like, oh. I even knowing it, I was like, Oh yeah, that rings. A, yep. That was, that's correct. I was just, um, but yeah, you, uh, you, so you, you, you taught me stuff, man. That's, uh, I don't know. A lot of, a lot of this new space stuff, you know, the, the people involved with it, they get, they get lionized. It's, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, okay. So like a hundred years ago, right. Electricity, it was a big deal. You have like at the world's fair, people would travel from hundreds of miles to see electricity or, a little bit before that, when, when Jules Verne wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, there's an entire chapter where the main character uh, realizes that the submarine is powered by electricity. And this is like a really big revelation, right? And now we just, you know, we just flip a switch and, and uh, you know, it's, yeah, whatever. And, and we don't care. And um, as, as a marketing guy, I love working in an industry where, you know, there's, there's just like an automatic fan base built in, right? Because rockets are cool right now. They're really cool. But um, at the end of the day, we're a, we're a freight shipping company. We just go, we just go up instead of mm -hmm. sideways, right? And uh, so hopefully, hopefully <laughs> we get to a point where, um, yeah, this is a cool thing, but it's, uh, you know just just a cool thing mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah pe people people tend to assume i don't know people tend to assume that i know stuff that i don't or that i'm like you know some crazy and it's like no no we're just it's, it's like okay this this entirely defeats the point but it's like oh yeah we're just nerds with pocket protectors at neil armstrong so <laughs> okay i shouldn't go comparing myself to neil armstrong that undermines what i was trying to say but does, does that make sense like i'm like i'm just i'm just some guy we're all um we're all we're all just you know guys that are driven mm -hmm. um the team i work with is amazing so i don't i don't mean to belittle that at all but mm -hmm. um yeah we're just i don't know don't <laughs> don't be in awe of us we're just yeah. you know we're just nerds with pocket protectors we're just doing what we love we're just trying to get to space and hopefully, you know, play some small role in, in benefiting the planet. So it's a whole community. Of yeah. Different people from different places. Yeah. And you're, you're a science communicator. Like people, people tune in to you to, to like learn stuff. Mm -hmm. That's an incredibly powerful thing. I'm, I'm thrilled to be like, thank you for megaphoning us. There are people that are going to watch this and know 
about us because they tuned in to learn something from you. I think that's, I think all um, companies should strive to, uh, the more people that know about it, the more, um, the more people um, be, I guess, supportive of it. Like there's a lot of people in the world who are not supportive of the kind of things that um, you and several other companies are planning to do. Um, And I wish I I could go out to them personally and tell them about all this, but um, I guess just doing what you do um, is kind of the best way of doing that, like showing rather than telling. Um, Thanks. I guess that's it for me. Um, All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, uh, I don't know what's going on down in Georgia, but up here it's like blizzard. It's like white out. Oh, yeah. Can't can't see more than 50 feet. (laughs) Yeah, it was snowing here. Um, It rarely, it smells like once a year here. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Even like where I live in like North Georgia, um, it rarely snows here. Oh man, that sounds nice. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it here. I love the change of the seasons. It keeps it keeps things fresh. <laughs> I mean, no, it just it snowed like in the middle of the night, um, like last night, and then we got some a few weeks ago. That's probably gonna be it for the entire year. Just yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I have a rule, which is that if you can't build a snow fort, it wasn't winter. Yeah, we tried to, we we had a good attempt at a snowman. It didn't really work, but yeah, there's just, it rarely happens. And then when it does, we get really excited about it. So, yeah. and all the schools close. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. So, yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Well, hey, great, great chatting. Um, if uh, if folks have questions about Blue Shift specifically, um, mm-hmm. if if uh, well, probably the easiest way to reach me directly is there's, there's, if you go to the Blue Shift website, just Google Blue Shift. No e in the blue. I've I made that mistake when I submitted my resume. <laughs> I made that mistake. But anyway, no e in blue. <laughs> um, and there's a contact page. So that's the best way to reach like me directly if you have questions. And uh, and and then how about how about you? If someone's got a question for armchair astronauts, is that something that you just do in the normal term? Or like, um, well, I guess I can go over it right now. Um, so the best way to contact us is either through our Twitter account or um, we have a Discord server. And if you have some kind of, um, I guess more professional kind of um, request. There's always our um, email, um, which all of that is gonna be description and the about page of our YouTube channel. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's been really cool having the whole arm trip. Thank you for watching this video. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment for more like this.